Delighted to be here with all of you today and uh, re really looking f uh, forward to sharing some thoughts on critical decisions. I'm going to tell you three stories from Mayo Clinic's history, and they are from the past, the present, and the future. Uh, the first story uh, demonstrates, as do they all, the critical decisions that people sometimes need to make. And the peculiar theme about these decisions through these three time periods is that critical decisions that were very bold and forward were made at times when no decision actually had to be made. They were times of relative calm and, and peacefulness and prosperity, um, but bold decisions were made at those times which really helped advance Mayo Clinic forward. So the first decision, let's dial the clock back to uh, 1896. This was a time when William Worrell Mayo, who's pictured in that uh, image, uh, the father of Mayo Clinic, had a crucial conversation. And you may think, what's the big deal? Doctors have crucial conversations all the time. But this one was a really crucial conversation. And I'll tell you about it in just a sec. Dr. William Worrell Mayo had been born in England and had the amazing fortune of studying under doc, uh, Dr. John, Walt, uh, uh, John Dalton, sorry about that, um, who was the father of the atomic theory of matter. And he was bit by the bug of scientific progress and scientific rigor and the scientific method. He then, uh, at one point in his early life, immigrated to the United States. And he settled in Indiana and went to medical school at Indiana Medical College in LaPorte, Indiana. And although uh, LaPorte, uh, Indiana was a bit of a backwater, and although Indiana Medical School was uh, an early version of uh, contemporary medical education, they happened to have a microscope 20 years prior to Harvard obtaining a medical microscope, amazingly. And Dr. Uh, Will had extensive exposure to microscopy during his uh, medical training in Laporte. He went on to set up a clinic, the Mayo Clinic, in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, in conjunction with the Sisters of St. Francis. And that is uh, an institution that uh, I know and love today. During his uh, downtime from taking care of patients, Dr. Will continued to study and work hard. So he would take regular trips, his vacations. He would go to the East Coast, he would go to Europe, and he would study and watch and observe and borrow the best secrets of all the people that he was watching at the greatest medical institutions around the world. So he was an avid observer and learner and an importer of best ideas. And one of the ideas he came home with in 1896 was the power of the microscope, which he had learned in medical school, but had been reinforced during a trip out to the East Coast. The problem was, at that time, the microscope that he fancied cost $600, which was a gigantic amount of money at that time. And so the crucial conversation began with Louise Mayo. Louise Mayo was his spouse and every bit his partner and his equal. Louise was a self-taught botanist who concocted various medicinals from botanicals, as was the, uh, the, the habit at the time. She was also the financier and, and really ran much of the practice and, and helped look after that aspect. So this was kind of the earliest version of a shark tank. And he went in and he, and he pitched his idea to Louise. He said, I think we need to get this microscope. It's for my patients. It's for our patients. And I'm going I'm to bring out a quote from Louise. She answered in the perfect way. She said, well, William, if you could do better by the people with this microscope and you really think you need it, we will do it. And so that's not the astounding part. The astounding part is that they then walked down to the bank and mortgaged their house to purchase that microscope. It's a bold decision, putting personal finance at risk for the good of their patients and for the good of the scientific advancement of the clinic. That was a bold and forward decision that they made to advance healthcare, to advance the clinic, and to advance the interest of their patients above and beyond their own. Dial forward to 2009. Uh, John Noseworthy, our former CEO, just prior to our current CEO, uh, took over Mayo Clinic. And at that time, Mayo Clinic was the number two ranked medical center in the country, doing very well. And over the course of about 25 years, Mayo Clinic had grown. And in fact, decisions had been made to open up sites in Jacksonville, Florida, and Phoenix and, uh, Phoenix and Scottsdale, Arizona, and across the Midwest in three states. 
And the, the idea was, we think we have a good thing going. We think we take great care of patients. We should make this available to broader populations of patients. And so uh, this was a loose organization, what was called a holding organization. And a holding organization's principles are that you gather together different groups, but you don't really control them and micromanage them. You let some local autonomy happen and let good things blossom at di different of the sites. And while that was true to some degree, we also found and recognized that there were differences in the way people were practicing that really weren't supported by best evidence or data. They were more local uh, traditions, uh, regional preferences, or training preferences that doctors had kept going uh, and not maybe modified in accordance with the best available data of the time. And so Dr. Noseworthy and his leadership team uh, considered uh, what we should be doing and made the bold decision and forward decision to do it a different way. And they made the decision to convert Mayo Clinic from a holding corporation to an operating corporation. An operating corporation fundamentally means we're doing this together. We're doing it in union. And that was one of the doctor's Mayo early principles. Uh, the union of forces will deliver the best care for our patients. And so you can imagine different people practicing in different ways in different states, all under the umbrella of Mayo Clinic, but with some autonomy, now all of a sudden being told, you're gonna practice in concert with your peers in the other sites. And we want you to work it out between you and have those conversations. And those conversations were tough conversations because people don't like their cheese moved. But those conversations forced us to look at the data, advance our practice, and do it in a scientifically valid way. And we became a more unified uh, um, medical organization as a result of that. And coincidentally, we became the number one ranked medical center in the United States in 2016 and have held that position since then. So that was a bold and forward decision by Dr. Noseworthy and his colleagues to make a tough decision in the best interest of our patients. Fast forward to today, and we have a new CEO for nine months now, Gianrico Ferrugia. And for those of you who have not met Gianrico Ferrugia, he is a force of nature. He is smart, he is aggressive, he is futuristic, he's innovative, and he does not accept no for an answer. And so, what do you do when you come in as the CEO of the number one healthcare organization in America? Do you stay complacent and try to keep it going, hang on to number one? Where do you go from number one? And so Gianrico made a bold and forward decision that number one wasn't good enough. And he told us, I wanna be 10 times better than number one because we can do that. And we're Mayo Clinic and people are looking for us to do that. Society is looking for us to do that, to raise the level of healthcare, not a little bit, not to improve incrementally, but to improve logarithmically. And so he, has cast forward a series of strategic initiatives, one which I'll tell you about now, uh, to hold that responsibility and fulfill that responsibility to the world and to our patients. And so one of the strategic initiatives that John Rico has kicked off is called the Mayo Clinic Platform. And I've been serving as the interim president of the Mayo Clinic Platform for about nine months. Platform is a very big word. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And John Rico cast a big vision for us Across the, um, across the spectrum of possibilities and said, go figure it out as a group of intelligent people in dynamic and iterative ways and do it fast and aggressively with futuristic vision. And so over the past nine months, we have worked together as a group of professionals from all the different areas of Mayo Clinic and outside partners to collect our ideas about what could Mayo Clinic do for human health and how could we power that through the power of big data and advance computing power in ways that truly are transformative to the way healthcare is delivered. Not a little bit better, but a whole magnitude of, of order better. And so <coughs> the Mayo Clinic platform involves three specific components at this time. We have a technology platform, that's the base, and that is meant to help us organize our information, keep it secure, because this is protected health information, and we are absolutely committed to the protection of that, to create relationships between the data so that we can power that up and deliver 
the best value for individual patients, but also to fulfill our promise as a research and educational organization and derive new knowledge and insights from that data so that the next generation of patients can have better care. And he wants us to do this fast and boldly in the most secure way and in the most innovative way. And so the Mayo Clinic platform is engaged with Google. Uh, we announced that a little while ago. And in fact, over the past two days, we've had 60 Googlers here on campus thinking about ways in which we can utilize their fortress-like security to protect our information. That information will be on our platform within the Google Cloud. We have the keys, they do not. They do not have access to our personal health information. And we will orchestrate that information and apply analytic tools to it for the delivery of care day by day, patient by patient. And we will also orchestrate research into de-identified or anonymized patient information so that we can advance the care as we've been doing for 155 years. So we have a technology platform. The second layer of the Mayo Clinic platform is lots of activities. And these activities include artificial intelligence engines and sandboxes, different uh, artificial intelligence solutions. Business ventures aim to not only discover things, but also package them into products, services, and solutions so that they actually have positive impact on human health. And that is one of our, our strong commitments at Mayo Clinic that's uh, enabled through the Department of Business Development. The top layer of the Mayo Clinic platform is all about governance, and that is about setting the rules. And we are very, very, uh, a very value-driven organization at Mayo Clinic. And the primary value is the needs of the patient come first. So as we enter into this digital age, there are going to be new questions, new problems, new uh, challenges, and we're going to have to face those. And I know how we're going to answer those. We're going to answer those questions in a principled, values-driven way. And we're going to be thinking about what are the needs of our patient as we answer those questions. And so orchestrating that platform will require governance and oversight and curation and values so that things are done in a proper way, preserving security and yet enabling innovation to flourish across Mayo Clinic with our partners and ultimately to power healthcare in the world. Right now our healthcare, even at the number one medical center in the country, is I would say something we will look back with embarrassment 10 years from now. We are at the intersection of the accumulation of big data and the availability of computing power that is unprecedented and these are coming together. We've been trying to do artificial intelligence for decades. We've been trying to do incredible research for decades, but now the computing power and the data is coming together in ways that we can make discoveries, and we are already seeing those discoveries that are better than a human being's brain can produce. This will not replace the doctors and the nurses. This will augment them and allow them to practice at the highest level without the crippling burden of bureaucracy and inefficiency and electronic medical record burnout that we're seeing that's rampant across the country. So we're extremely excited to take healthcare to the next level. We're looking for the best partners in the world. We think we found a very good and highly capable partner in Google. Uh, we're in discussions with partners all over the country to advance healthcare forward in the biggest way possible through the Mayo Clinic platform. And so that again, was a bold decision and a forward-looking decision by the CEO of Mayo Clinic not to settle into number one, but in a period of relative success to do something really, really hard. And this is really, really hard. Um, we're looking forward to uh, stretching ourselves on behalf of our patients and to really delivering uh, on the vision that our original Dr. Mayo had uh, to transform healthcare for uh, the good of uh, human beings through big data, data science, and technology. So with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Otley.